hello future engineers welcome to my youtube channel if you're still new to my channel please don't forget to subscribe if you like what i am doing just to make create videos lecture videos and sample problem videos so that you can study in your own related to civil engineering uh, subjects so in this video i'm going to discuss although the explanations are based on the explanations of the author by Pytel and Kesalas. so this is about strain and i will discuss all about principles and theories on strains So another important criterion for design is the determination of deformations or strains. So these values must be controlled within certain limits in order not to overstress the material for safety purposes. Strain is a geometric quantity that measures the deformation of a body. The two types of strain are one normal strain normal strain characterizes dimensional changes and second shear strain describes distortion or changes in angles so that's the those are the effect of loads or forces on bodies deformable bodies that must be accounted for and evaluated the relationship between stress and strain is very important to design because it defines the mechanical properties of materials. The discussion to follow is confined to actually loaded members, though the concepts may also be applicable to complicated loadings in subsequent lessons where both statics and compatibility are applied to derive force displacement relations. The stiffness of a material is also important as are other mechanical properties like hardness, toughness, and ductility. These materials follow standard tests in the laboratory, but you will confine yourselves in one important test, the tensile test of steel, and use its results to illustrate several important concepts of material behavior. The normal or axial strain is defined as the elongation per unit length. So it is defined by this mathematical expression, the deformation, which is either elongation or contraction divided by the length of the specimen. So this is an illustration of a specimen in its undeformed shape. The length is total length is L at its undeformed shape and we have here from the fixed end to 0.0 uh, length is in general X and the distance between these two points OA is delta X. Now in the deformed shape the length becomes L plus the deformation and we have here points O prime and A prime, which now have uh, original length plus the slight change in length, which is denoted by delta D. So this is the deformation of a prismatic bar. Courtesy of the, the clippings taken from the book by Pytel and Kisilas. So units of strain is mm per mm or inch per inch or it may be unitless, interpreted as unitless. The elongation or contraction of the material may be caused by loads, temperature changes or combination of loads and temperature changes. So those are the different sources of elongation or contraction. 
if the deformation is not uniform, you must define strain at a point even below. So for a situation where the deformation is not uniform, so the strain is defined as the limit of delta D over delta X as delta X approaches zero, or simply the, the derivative with respect to X of the deformation. If the distribution of the axial strain is known, the elongation of the bar can be computed from the equation below. So deformation is equal to, it is taken from here by integrating. So differential deformation is equal to strain times differential x. Therefore, uh, deformation is integral of, of strain times dx. When the axial strain is uniform at all points, equation 2.3 yields uh, deformation is simply strain times length because uh, the strain is uniform at all points. So it is constant for that situation. So that's why we only integrate the differential of x, which is from C2 to L to L. So this is identical with equation 2.1 before, which was strain is equal to deformation over length. Note that the above calculations are also applicable to compression. The difference is strains for compressions for compression are negative. To make sure that axial strain is uniform, the specimen shown below has its ends attached to grips of a testing machine. So we have here a specimen where the grips attached to or the ends attached to grips of a testing machine in order not to slip. So we have here the gauge length L. We have two mark points. So this is the specimen used in standard tension test. During the test, records of the gradually varied loads and the corresponding elongations are noted and converted into stress and strain, where stress is force over area and strain is deformation over length. So the, the data must be recorded well in order to plot them accurately in order to determine or sketch point, plot those points in order to compare with the uh, curve, stress strain curve, and to find relationship between stress and strain. A and L are the original cross sectional area and gauge length, respectively. The computed values are also termed as nominal stress and nominal strain because the results are based on the original length and original uh, cross-sectional area or size of the specimen not with the actual uh, dimensions after the specimen undergoes deformation so we have here the typical stress strain diagram of a steel so we have the, on the vertical axis the stress, which is P over A for a portion where stress is proportional to strain, or we have really state line relationship, or in general P over A, then strain delta L over L. So this is the specimen, and notice also of the uh, deformation. So the specimen is subjected to a tensile force or tensile stress. So that's why we have the specimen undergoes elongation. So this is the portion from zero load to uh, stress where we have state line relationship. We call the end of that state line portion as the proportional limit. Then we have here the elastic limit, the upper yield point, 
the lower yield point. Yield point is the point where the material starts to behave as uh, plastic. Then this is supposedly almost straight or flat where there is no appreciable increase in stress but there is an appreciable there is an increase in strain then after that it undergoes strain hardening and there is a point where it's difficult to stress although the load is increased and the highest ordinate in this diagram is called the ultimate strength and we have here the point where the material ruptures or fails and prior to that uh, situation the material undergoes what we call necking so from zero to elastic limit we have the elastic limit range from yield point to the lower portion of this part the end where the curve is almost ending its flatness is the plastic range then we have the stain hardening range so within proportional limit the slope of the straight line portion is called the Young's modulus of elasticity so in the straight line portion stress is proportional to strain since stress is force over area uh, and that's the deformation within Hooke's law so p over a equals constant of proportionality which is the Young's modulus of elasticity the slope of this straight line portion time strain which is this deformation over length so therefore this deformation is PL over A so that's the normal longitudinal or that's the deformation for actually loaded uh, member and within Hoke's law or within this state line portion only So let's redefine some of the important elements in the stress strain diagram. So the portion of the stress strain diagram where you can see a straight plot between stress and strain where Hooke's law applies is the this one, this portion here. So within Hooke's law, stress is proportional to strain and this is the relationship and we call that equation 2.4. The stress at the end of the state line portion is called proportional limit. The constant of proportionality E is called the Young's modulus of elasticity with an approximate value of 200 gigapascals or 29 times 10 to the 6 PSI for steel. So take note that this is the sustain diagram obtained from the standard tension test on a structural steel specimen. The stress value beyond which the material can no longer go back to its original shape and size is called the elastic limit. So when the material is loaded before this point is reached then it can go back to its original shape and size when the load is removed but beyond that it will undergo permanent uh, uh, deformation when the material is loaded beyond the elastic limit the permanent elongation that remains after the removal of the load is called permanent set so in your experience if you have a rubber band for example by keeping on stretching it as long as the load is is such that it can still go back to its original shape and size then this elastic limit is not yet reached but 
if you keep on stretching the rubber band and so on and so forth, compare it with the original length, if it can no longer go back to its original length, then it, uh, it means that the material is stretched or stressed beyond the elastic limit. And the difference between the final length of the material and its original length is the what we call permanent set. The stress value where the stress strain curve starts to become almost horizontal is called, this is supposedly almost horizontal, is called yield point and the corresponding stress is known as the yield stress or yield strength. From zero stress to elastic limit, we call that the elastic limit range defined in the earlier slides. From the yield point to the end of the almost horizontal curve, the material undergoes large deformation without a corresponding increase in stress. This is called the plastic range. For materials that do not have a well-defined yield point, yield point is determined by the method called offset method. The yield stress of these materials is determined by the point of intersection between the 0.2% strain parallel to the initial tangent and the intersection of this parallel line and the stress strain curve is called yield point at 0.2% offset. So it is shown here. So this is the initial tangent, then we have 0.2% offset draw parallel line to this initial tangent it intersects the stress strain curve, then that's the point of intersection is the theoretical yield point at 0.2% offset. The ultimate stress or ultimate strength is the highest ordinate on the stress strain curve. From the end of the almost horizontal curve to, to the ultimate strength, the material undergoes strain hardening range beyond which the material ruptures. The stress at which failure occurs is called rupture stress or rupture strength. Remember the end of the stress strain curve. Prior to failure, the material undergoes a phenomenon called necking and the material stretches rapidly causing the cross section to narrow as uh, illustrated in the preceding slide. The actual rupture strength is higher than the ultimate strength because the cross section reduces. So it's the situation. So if the cross section reduces, load at rupture divided by area at rupture, which is smaller than the original area, will cause the stress to be higher. So the actual rupture strength is higher than the ultimate strength, but it is the ultimate strength that is used for safety purposes. However, this is the reason the ultimate strength is commonly used as the maximum stress that the material can carry because of safety purposes. So this is the illustration failed tensile test specimen showing necking or narrowing of the cross section. So the original uh, dimension area is bigger, larger than the phenomenon at rupture. The working stress denoted by sigma w, also called the allowable stress, is the safe axial stress used in design. The idea of defining these allowable st stresses is to make sure they fall in the straight line portion so that stresses at these levels are within the elastic limit. Since the proportional limit is difficult to determine, either the yield stress or the ultimate stress is used divided by a number greater than 1 called the factor of safety, Fs. So the proportional limit and the ultimate stress. So the proportional limit, though difficult to determine, that's about half of the ultimate, uh, ultimate stress. And the working stress is, 
intended to be almost half also of the proportional limit. So from that idea, then we can say that the factor of safety under this condition will be about 4. It's approximately 4. But for still, the factor of safety is slightly greater than 1 but less than 2, definitely. Because still is has its still has that characteristic that is uh, well defined homogeneous and the material is certain and we know the characteristic of steel so this working stress is equal to allowable stress which is based on yield strength divided by factor of safety this is for steel and let's call that equation 2.5a while for other materials it is the ultimate strength divided by factor of safety so of course the factor of safety for other materials would be higher as compared to that of steel so the allowable stresses are usually defined in codes that the novice has nothing to worry the determination of the factor of safety is based on experience, material uncertainties, non-uniformity of the properties of materials, skills of workers in positioning materials, and the seriousness of damage when the member fails. So these are the considerations in deciding the value of factor of safety. Thus, for steel, factor of safety is lower compared to other materials because we all know steel. Actually, loaded bars are assumed to have uniform stress and strains. Aside from this, the stress level is assumed to be within Hooke's law. So, stress is equal to modulus, Young's modulus of elasticity times strain. So, P over A equals E times deformation over length. So this is for actually loaded bar and this is the formula which was derived also earlier. If the stain or stress in the bar is not uniform, then equation 2.6 is invalid. In the case where the actual stain varies with the x coordinate, the elongation of the bar can be obtained by integration as stated in equation 2.3. So deformation is integral from 0 to L of strain dx. So using strain equals stress over E, then stress P over A, then strain is P over EA, where P is the internal axial force. And though, so we get this expression uh, deformation elongation or contraction is integral from 0 to L of stress over E because P over A is stress over E dx. So from there, this is the expression for the situation in the bar where it is not uniform.